So, uh, so join me in welcoming Dr. Don Jaruszewski to the stage. That's just one of her many patients. And Don, before we get into the background of this surgery and the impact on the lives that you've touched through it, tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been at the Mayo Clinic and what is your, what's your overall practice and role? So I am one of the thoracic surgeons here, one of two that covers everything in the chest at this hospital. Yes. <laughs> um, except for heart. We have heart people that do that, but you know, we're more important. <laughs> um, but I actually started here in 1998. So I was a resident in general surgery before this hospital was even finished being built. Wow. And then I went away for additional training and came back on staff as faculty in 2006. So. Fantastic. And, uh, and, and you and I have talked previously, but the, the pectus practice is fairly unusual. And tell us how you got interested and started uh, as a pectus expert. Well, I think several people in here have said they've seen my TED talk, so ah. <laughs> that's a long answer. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, just, just briefly, um, you know, when I finished general surgery, I went to Baylor in Texas for training, and the plan was that I was going to be back here on staff. Mm -hmm. and. When I finished that two years, the, the CPC and funding and stuff didn't go through, and I had what I thought was probably the worst time of my life. I had no job, and mm. um, it, it just shows you that when a door closes, you have to look at other opportunities. So yeah. this, this spot for a year was open at UCLA, and I went there. There was a famous pectus surgeon there that named Funkelsrud that I worked with uh, once a week, and I had never heard of pectus, never treated it. Um, as far as I know, you, you know, it was something you didn't even need to operate on. Right. And then I came here, back here, and um, you know, we we slowly developed uh, techniques because back then, no one did this type of surgery on adults. They did this old-fashioned where they cut all the cartilage and they'd wire the chest. And so, uh, I had gone out to um, Norfolk where Dr. Nuss, who is a pediatric surgeon, did the bars where he'd put braces in, in young children to fix it. And so my first assist, Jesse Lackey, who's been with me since I was a resident, he and I sat down and we said, okay, how can we make this work in adults? So we came up with what seemed like crazy ideas, but they worked. We, we had like a crane that was attached to the bed and a clamp that forced the sternum up. And then the weight was still too much for the bars, so we did multiple DARS and we did reinforcements. We, we came up with all these techniques, and we are now the gold standard for adult pectus um, in the world. Fantastic. And tell us about the bar. Yeah, the round of applause. That's <laughs> and and just, uh, just to give it some context, I mean, think about Mayo Clinic as solutions and hope. I mean, this is just a great example of providing that and pushing the envelope through innovation to, to be able to do things that nobody else could, could do. So tell us about the bar. So these bars, this one is stainless steel, and in general we use stainless steel in the patients. Um, and we have this giant set that costs about $60,000 that has uh, all arrays of, of lengths of bars. And Jesse hand bends all these bars for every patient for me. And so mm -hmm. we measure out and we... Jesse, let's see your biceps. Are you in pretty good shape? Yeah, Jesse's strong. <laughs> But we, um, you know, every patient's just a little bit different on how you want, you know, how high and where you want the angles and stuff. Really? And so um, we, we have become very famous. Um, this is a big social media group. They all talk to each yes. other. And so from a cosmetic standpoint, we have superb results. And part of that is because of, you know, the, the technique of, you know, the artistry of bending bars, multiple bars, shapes, you know, where you place bars and, and reinforcing. Yes. But um, we've also, there, there, there are several things that have been critical here. One is, you know, surgically our excellence, you know, our outcomes, you know, our hospitalizations, two days, our anesthesia, anesthesia has been critical to, uh, we use intraoperative methadone, so they're not having pain afterwards, you know, we use on -cue. all of these things that we've developed, and we've created a service line that no one else in the world has, and so we've integrated the multiple specialties, so when you come here to see me for, to talk about your pectus, you're not just seeing me, you're gonna go to our cardiopectus clinic. And so you're gonna see doctors Mukadam or Arsanjani who specialize in physiology. We're doing echocardiograms that no one else in the world does where they lay them and they do different positions of mm. how they lay. 
Um, if we can get the space and resource, we're gonna start doing um, actually exercise echoes because most of these patients have symptoms with exercise. Right. And all of this is happening where they're seeing genetics. We have physical therapy that works because there's so many of them have scoliosis and it's so many departments, pulmonology, that we have this in exclusive thing that nobody says. And you look online, the patients are like, oh my God, I saw my family practice doctor and they said, don't worry, it's cosmetic. I went to Mayo Clinic and I saw all these professionals and I saw this test and I saw that my you know, right ventricular outflow tract was decreased by 30% and when mm. I stood up, it dropped to 15% of normal and that's why I almost pass up when I lean over, you know, and wow. it's, it's really cool. Oh yeah, and t how, talk about the actual physiologic and medical consequences of this condition because as, our, as your patient described, he also had been told it was a cosmetic issue only. But obviously, that was significant. He was embarrassed and felt he had to hide it. But on top of that, he couldn't breathe right. Correct. Yeah. Well, it's, it's two factors. Number one, it's the mechanics of the chest. And so when the chest actually caves in, the way patients breathe is um, a, a much higher abdominal component than they're supposed to. So they kind of guppy breathe. Mm. So they're not able to get nice. They have a, a restrictive physiology on their, their respiratory pattern. But the more important part probably of the defect is the fact that the heart is compressed. So if you think about what the heart is, it's just a pump. And when you exercise or, or increase activity, you need to increase oxygen. And the heart does that by two ways. It beats faster to move blood through quicker, and it expands and increases the stroke volume. And these guys, their hearts pend underneath the defect, so they can increase their stroke volume. So they're fine if you have little sprints, you know, but once mm. they try to do anything with endurance to push out, they just fall off the curve. And you see that. We do the um, exercise testing, and you look at their VO2, and it just craters down once they get into an anaerobic mode. And, sorry, I, I, always, I always give long answers. You're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that knows me is like, shut up. <laughs> Don't ask her another question. <laughs> no, no, but... Our research, and I have some of our research people, I saw them here earlier, we have MDs from all over the world that, that come here to do research. Um, I, I was very fortunate that I had a donor that gave me money and has funded most of my practice. We have almost 800 consented practice patients in Amazing. and involved in research here. And we've more than 100 you know, publications, presentations related to practice, but we've shown that this is not a cosmetic thing. We've broken that myth. And you know our, our articles and our data from cardiology is used all over the world for mm. these patients to Perfect. show that you fix them. It makes a big difference in their lives. It makes a big difference you know, in, yes, there's a huge um, psychologic component to, to having a dent in your chest, but right. it's also very important you know, mechanistic and cardiopulmonary physiology. And, and when you said 800 patients, and your total number's probably even higher, so you know, put that on the scale of other centers that do, how many centers, say, in the U.S. do this kind of work, and where, where do we fit? Sure, so, so there's, there's basically two types. There's the pediatrics, mm -hmm. where the pediatric surgeons do this, and then there's adult. And there's a little bit of crossover. Um, uh, we always say anybody can do the kids. It's, you know, you could use a popsicle stick to fix, you know, a young kid. So there's a lot of centers that do young kids and peds, but the average number is you know 30 to 40. Mm. Um, we do about 300 pectus-related cases a year, and that includes young ones. I do young ones too. I love young, easy ones, and you know <laughs> we'll go down to children's to those, but and then 16 and over here. But our oldest is 78, which is the oldest patient in the world that's ever wow. been, been operated on for pectus, at least documented. But um, for volume of older adults, 30s and 40s, um, you know, we're certainly the largest um, that's publishing, you know, largest yes. known center in yeah. the world. Fantastic. Wow. And uh, I'm going to open it up if anyone has questions for Dr. Jaruszewski uh, about this at Taylor or here. Any questions? Uh, there's, there's a question in the back. Oh, maybe the mic. Thanks. Well, yeah, I can yeah. get my mic. Well, we'll take this real quick and then we'll come yeah. back. I doubt you. So uh, of course. Cool. Oh. Um, since it's now just that it's more than cosmetic, it's a real tough condition, have we increased the number of patients because the insurance pays it, or people are still willing to pay it even if it's out of pocket? So, so we still do a lot of international. Repeat the question for Taylor. Oh, sure. So the question was, now that we've shown that it's definitely, uh, you know, has a medical implication, do, 
are we increasing patients because insurance pays for it? And um, the, so the answer to that is yes. So we are getting more patients paid for, but we still have a, a large predominant of cash pay patients because we do a lot of international patients and, and we have a cash package and they come from all over the world for us to, to do their repair. So I, I know somebody who has practice excavator and um, his complaint is always, he tolerates exercise fine, but always you know, looking at your eye watch and Apple watch and seeing your heart rates are going high. When you exercise, his heart rates go probably 15, 20 beats faster than it should be for somebody who's getting uh, aerobic exercise. Is there a downside to that for somebody who chronically exercises, you know, who exercises and has chronically high heart rates? So we practice? don't know. The, the, the answer to that is nobody knows. And, and I, I would say 90% of patients that come see me ask me, so what's going to happen to me if I don't fix this? And we don't know that. And the only way that you would ever know that is if you took twin populations and you fixed one and not and followed them through, through their lifetime. Um, there's always been that... Um, saying it's not really a myth we don't know that if you know you have so many heartbeats you know in your heart and you know cardiology has a tendency to want to slow us down with beta blockers and stuff but nobody really knows but he has a higher heart rate because that's the only way his heart has increase. to increase his cardiac output and it is a strain and so um we, oops, i'm absolutely that on the floor because i keep dropping <laughs> it. um we uh we did a study actually looking at cardiac strain and echoes of patients interop before and after fixing. And it, there is a much higher negative strain on the heart before you fix it because of the deformation. And so whether that transmits to a lifetime, we don't know. Um, part of our, 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 we call it the cardiopectus clinic that we have is the testing that we're now doing on these patients before is going to be followed up and done when we remove their bars at three years. And so, over a lifetime of, you know, probably my lifetime of the next 20 years where we can follow these patients out, we'll begin to see, you know, uh, you know, are these patients reversing like younger patients? Like if you take a 40 year old and you fix them, do they get reversed to normal on their testing mm -hmm. like you would see in a teenager or are we catching this too late and they're having some damage? And, and that's when we can really answer that question. Okay, time for one more question. Is there one in the back? Danny. Danny? Uh, uh, Doctor, how long does the surgery take? It depends on how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, like I did a 16-year-old this morning that took me about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, if I, I, I've got a 50-something-year-old that I'm doing after this that, you know, is probably going to be a lot stiffer. There's a, you know, wrist and was a fracture, and you have to fix one of the fractures, and so it can be three or four hours. But it's not a very long procedure. Yep. Can I just ask a quick question? Is, is this a congenital problem, or why is someone born with this problem? So it is a congenital in most cases. You do have de novo like any other mutation, but um, speaking of, um, we have so many patients that have cousins, dads. I have families that I've fixed like five members of their family, and so we, we, we've in the past applied for a genetics grant, but what we really want to do is, is try to get money to Mm -hmm. draw blood and really Good. be able to run this because there are mm -hmm. genetic links like through the connective tissues, Marfan's and those, but the kind of the rest of the base patient, you know there's something there, but mm -hmm. um, it's never been identified. And so that's on my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, please join me in thanking and congratulating Dr. <laughs>